Utah is an amazing state. I am proud to not only be made in Utah, but to be able to raise my kids here. We have so many natural resources, wild, amazing things, our animals to our no oceans. We do have a really salty lake though. We have orange dirt, we have mountains, we have snow. We've got it all here. Amazing resources. You know what our greatest natural resources is? In fact, only North Dakota and South Dakota surpass us in our birth rates. Yes, children, we are among the most prolific. In fact, if you say you have eight kids, people are like, you from Utah? I don't have eight kids, by the way. Now, normally this playground would be swarming with children, but it's not because there's a pandemic. Our world's gotten suddenly smaller as we look at the fact that we all can be affected by the choices and actions of others, but there's an unspoken pandemic. This is the pandemic of sexual abuse. In fact, Utah's 11th. Local news shared that two months ago. We don't talk about that. We did not become number 11 because of the a 40 or 50 deaths or a thousand cases that we've had. We're talking about thousands, thousands. They say it's one in three girls, one in five boys, but after my book, Love Me Too came out, it feels more like 50% from the conversations I've had with people. This is not, this is an unspoken pandemic. We don't want to talk about it because it's uncomfortable. And you have to say words that grandma wouldn't approve of. Grandma's not comfortable with it. So much better to just not talk about it. Well, how's that working out? It's not working. It's getting worse. And the line between victim and perpetrator are becoming thinner and often the same person because hurt people hurt others. Two and a half blocks from here. I live right over there. Two and a half blocks from here. The young lady started coming over to my house with her brothers and I noticed because I was molested from two and a half to 14. I have wisdom from experience that I was able to recognize in this young lady that something had happened to her. And our children played together and people have often said, well, why would you let them play together? How could you do that? Yes, yeah, so much better to isolate the victim right? I let them play together because I already taught my children about appropriate um, touching, appropriate feelings. And I'm not talking about only good feelings. I'm talking about like when I bathed them and we rubbed their arm and we didn't get uncomfortable with that because it's their arm. If I say elbows, knees, and toes, you don't get uncomfortable. But oh, we passed over the private areas of the body. We don't talk about that. No. As they rubbed their arm and they did such a good job, I'd say, amazing, you do so good at this. Now you're in charge of your arm. It's great not only for bathing, but if they hit someone, I'm like, did you realize that was your arm attached to you? Look, it's an amazing thing. You're in control of that. And we move up to the elbow and how this gets stinky. And then we talk about this. We don't get uncomfortable when we talk about breast cancer. Oh no, girls have breasts. Guess what? Men get breast cancer too. Sexual abuse is not just a girl's or women's issue. But we don't get uncomfortable talking about things, but we get uncomfortable talking about, you know, breasts or vagina or penises or bump, and we have them all. And you gotta teach your kids how to bathe them too. Teach them. And then when they get here and they get here, they're in charge of it, and no one's gonna touch that, even you. And if anyone does, you're gonna be in the room because it's gonna be a doctor's appointment to make sure it's healthy. But we don't go and pee out in our neighbors. Now, I hope you live in a neighborhood that your neighbor's not out peeing in the yard. <laughs> you know, unless they're little boys, that happens because they're working on AIM, right? But we don't, there are things that are done private, but the blinds are so blurred between public and private. Just look at Hollywood, closed door to open door. I close the door when I'm with my husband. Hollywood doesn't. And when that comes up on TV with my kids, I can go, oh, wait, um, I think they're having communication problems because they're doing this before they figured out. And my kids are like, oh, here goes mom again. Again, again, I'm talking to them. So we're talking, putting in framing of how we bathe them, but also in how we talk about it. It is not taboo. In fact, there is nothing that's taboo. Who do I want my kids to go to to talk about these things? What is appropriate? Is my goal to raise children like we did in the Victorian times, to get them when they come out to society all lined up in their finery? and that people can look them up and down off of their lineage, their clothing, and who their mama and daddy are 
to see if they're an appropriate. How well did that work out? I'm not trying to get my kids ready for the Victorian meat market. I'm trying to teach my children to hold their head high, to stand up for what they are and who they are and their value. And if I'm shaming them that we don't talk about it, when they're at school and their friends are talking about it, my son playing on this very playground heard that he's supposed to play with his penis until it gets hard and put it in a girl even if she says no. There are so many violations of consent. Eight years old, he heard it from a little neighbor boy right behind there. He came home and I'm so proud of myself I didn't drive off the road. But my son was talking to me. Aren't I the one I want him talking to? So we talked. I'm writing a children's book about that conversation. We leaned into that conversation. And as he grew again and again, anytime, anything he wanted to talk about, when you hear about the kids here in South Jordan, Utah, where I live last year, we had suicides in our high school. It's not for us to say, oh, I can't believe that that kid died by suicide. What were they doing wrong in their home? When our children hear that from us, they're hearing judgment. And when we're judging our neighbor, we're judging our child. We're telling them that there are things that we can't talk about, that we're better than. That was a Victorian thing. That's passe. They can get access to any information they want on the internet. All they have to do is ask those smartphones, I mean, excuse me, that crack cocaine we've handed them, access to any information. Don't we want them coming to us? So as we are asking them to come to us and we're hearing about our neighbors and the misfortunes that they go through, put that in your own heart. What if that were you? Have you sat your kid down when you hear about something and said, son, daughter, do you know how much I love you? Do you know how valuable you are to me? And whatever happened for this young man or this young lady to think that their life, whatever they were going through, they, that that dying was something that, do you know how much I love you? How much I need you? How valuable you are to us? What a resource you are to us and to the world and the good you're gonna do for our city and our state and our, you get what I'm saying? Have you leaned into that conversation? Not judgment, because shame never worked. We take little Joey, we tell him what he can and cannot say. And as he grows into Joseph, we take him to corporate events on sexual harassment and say, now Joseph, here's the list of the things you can't do. Don't think about Susan and her breasts. Don't think about her breasts. Don't. It's like the purple elephant in the room. We don't, it's there. We got it. By objectifying and shaming and judgment, we're not creating a conversation. We're creating a list of rules. And then they say, but be kind on LinkedIn. A man approached me and said that I was alluring and beautiful and I, he lives in my neighborhood. Could we meet up? And I was like, not interested. Contact me again. I'm sending it to the police. It's a professional networking site. I was very clear. And I shared with other people because it's not the first time I'm getting, I've gotten pictures sent to me on professional networking sites that I don't want to see, right? I'm getting these things that I'm telling people, consent, interest, come on. We can't just be spamming people with this information. It's not professional. I'm not saying it's not appropriate. I'm saying it's not professional. I, I can do those things with my, who I consent with, my husband, but I don't want that from some stranger. And the lady with lots of initials behind her name said, well, that wasn't very kind. And here you pretend to talk about kindness. Let me be very clear. Kindness can never be sacrificed for truth. Truth trumps kindness. And those of you that are religious, that's another resource we have here in Utah. We're Christians. We believe in Jesus Christ. In Matthew 12, 34, he said, O ye generation of vipers, vipers as in snake, as in who tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, as in Satan. And he called them, O ye generation of Satan. I'm sure that the people he said that to didn't like it. And he went on to speak about words evil or good words. We can't have it both ways. We can't be speaking with judgment and think that we're going to only get love, right? She wants me to be kind. It's another form of victim blaming. If somebody approaches you in a way that you shouldn't, well, you should have done something different. No, 
be clear. Our words have value. And teaching our children how to use their words, we just send them to school. We just send them out into the world and hope that it all works out and that they know that we love them. What I did with my young daughter, because you know when kids hear things that are <laughs> uncomfortable, they giggle. If they're made to feel uncomfortable, they, <laughs> they giggle. So when they hear those words that make them feel <laughs> uncomfortable, that they have an idea of what to do with that, that they know what to say or to what to do. So when my daughter is at school and she heard somebody say something to her that she didn't ask for, wasn't something she consented to, that she held her head high and kept on walking, sending the signal very clear with no giggles and niceness and making them feel good, that that was not something she was interested in. I want my children to hold their head high because they know their value, they know that their body is theirs, and that they know there is nothing that they can do that will get me to judge or shame them. I am here to love them. That is my job as the resource that I have been blessed with as a parent, is to teach them to how to navigate this world until they're able to do it with my sheltering and loving arms. But again, if you're judging your neighbor, you're distancing your child. And it's not in a faraway country, far away, happening over there. It's here. Remember, my friend, two and a half blocks, another girl over this way, sex trafficked by her mother. The neighbor had to kidnap her. Be aware. And if we have the awareness to realize without judgment that it's happening here, then we can do something about it that we can protect our greatest natural resource that we have as Utahns, that we have as parents. Talk to your kids. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm Lita Green.